Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is Joni Stahl. I hope everybody is doing well today. It's good to be back, even though I was just here two days ago. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of videos lately, but hey, if the wind is blowing, the ship is going to sail. Well, before I get started, I would like to pray, and I want to jump right into this. This is not one of my typical things I share. And I had to do a lot of praying about it and a lot of thought. But I'm ready now. And there just comes a point where I just have to do it. And I'm doing it because from my heart, I'm just ready to do it. So Father in heaven, I just come before you and I just want to thank you. Yet for another day to be a great and mighty blessing, Lord, in your hands. A vessel that pours forth the ointment of your name. A vessel that is humbled. A heart that's pliable in your hands. Your servant friend. Lord, I have nothing to gain for myself. But I can't come to gain all things for you. That you would take a hold of this vessel and that you would help me, Lord. Help me to say the things that I re believe I received from you. But I'll leave it up to the witness of your Holy Spirit. To bear witness to the hearts of the hearers. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to be a blessing. I commit my whole heart and all that I am into your hands. And I ask that you speak through me and give me the words to speak. Because Lord, I stand in that place with Moses, even though I'm nothing like him, because there's no match to that man. But sometimes I feel, Lord, I stumble all over myself and I have an impediment. So, Lord, I pray you take the imperfect. I pray you take the weak and the thing that is not. Lord, that you may show yourself beautiful and by a great and mighty contrast. So now, Lord, I commit and I commend myself into your hands and commit this into your hands and that your grace would be upon my lips. In Jesus' name, amen. So before I get started, I would like to establish one thing. What I'm about to share with you today is personal. I'm going to share a dream. I'm going to begin with sharing a dream I had on June 1st. I'm going to share with you something I received, <clears throat> excuse me, on the 3rd of this June, 2021. And I just want to be very careful for all of you to know, I am not theatrical. I am not dramatic. I stay down the fairway with theology, with eschatology. Because I, I just want to be very careful so that you don't think I'm flying off into some one way or another. I'm just sharing with you some experiences that I've had in the last few days. And take it as you will. Just take it as you will. I'm only sharing. I am not saying anything else. but. Joan's heart is being shared with you that are listening. And you can take it to the Lord in prayer. Okay, so here I go. On June 1st, before I woke up in the morning, I had this dream. I saw myself in three different sequences. First, I saw myself, it started out that I was in a house. And I was talking to another woman. I don't even know who it was. And it was just random talk. And all of a sudden, I looked out of the window and I saw the sun was beginning to set. And a panic entered into me like, oh, you know how you do that? Like, And it felt like that same kind of panic, like if you've left your, your purse somewhere and you're like, oh, you know, like that, that shock. Because it wasn't that I just went, oh yeah, it was like a shock came into my body where I went like this as soon as I saw the sun was setting. 
And I said to the woman, I said, I have to go. I have to go. It's the, it's Shabbat. It's Shabbat. I have to observe it. Well, I don't, I'm not a Shabbat observer. Um, I agree if you want to uh, observe it, there's no prohibition to it. So please understand, please don't write to me and say, just let me stop my dream right here. Um, just listen to the dream. But, you know, I just want to make that clear because some people observe it and that's perfectly 100% good. And But for me, I just, I don't observe the 24 hour sundown to sundown. Now I'm going to continue without any further interruption. So um, I said to her, I've got to go. I've got to go. I have to observe the Sabbath. I have to observe the Sabbath. And she's like, what? You don't. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I have to go. I have to go. And she was like, okay. And so I flew out of the door. And next thing you know, I'm in a different sequence. Now I'm at, I'm at another place. And I see myself in, uh, with other people. And they were just, it was random. People were talking, laughing, walking around. And I felt panicky, like, where, where can I go? I felt like I needed to find a holy place. And it was more than I needed to. It felt like I needed. It was a demand within me. It was everything in me. Like I need to find a holy place to observe Shabbat. And yet in my mind, I was like, well, this is strange because I don't typically observe it, but everything in me overrode that. And I was like, I've got to observe Shabbat. I've got to observe it. So I the people were like, why, why? Like, they were like, what's your deal? What's going on with you? And I was like, you don't understand. I can't, I can't observe Shabbat here. The sequence changes. I'm in some place that now it's night. Now it's night. And all of a sudden I appear in some place like Coney Island. You know how it's on the coast? And there's a restaurant over here on my right. And I see people outdoor dining. They're drinking wine. They're eating expensive food. I've never been there. So if there's expensive food there or not, I don't know. I'm just saying in my dream, they were eating like the finest of the food. Like I can see just by the caliber of the restaurant, like, oh, that's an expensive restaurant. But I didn't care. And so I stood there by the entrance and I looked to my left and everything, the Ferris wheel was lit up and it was going around and around and people are laughing and talking and walking by. And somebody comes out, the hostess comes out, a young man, and he said, uh, can I seat you? Would you like to come into the restaurant? And I said, no, you don't understand. He goes, we have outdoor seating. And I go, no, you don't understand. I can't be here. I said, it's, it's getting late. I, I have to observe Shabbat and I can't do it here. Next thing you know, I get in a little dinghy. You know, if you don't know what a dinghy is, it's a little tiny boat. And I get in some little boat. Next thing you know, I'm in a river, not the ocean, but I'm going upstream. I know I'm going up. I'm in this boat and I'm by myself and it's dark out and it was a full moon. And you know how it lights up everything, you know, that moon glow. And I was like, I got to get there. I got to get there. And I, I, you know, disembarked and I got on some plateau and I go into some building and I was by myself and I look out of a window and I can see an inlet of the ocean and this, the moon shining on it. And I thought, and I just stood there in the dark. And right then I got a message on my cell phone and I looked at my cell phone and I saw these words, um, Joni, behold, look up into the sky. And I woke up. Well, I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit when I woke up. I mean, his presence was in our bedroom here. And I went out to the living room and and it was ruminating, like it was echoing inside my spirit. Joni. But I could hear this voice. I could hear a voice saying, I can actually, see, that's the part you guys need to hear. It wasn't that I was just reading it. There was a voice that came with it that read it to me as I was reading it. And it was like this, Joni, behold, look up into the sky, like with such great exhilarating 
like, this is it. This is it. Look up in the sky. Right. And I, and I, I knew what that meant. And I woke up. So time marched on and I just kept thinking, Joni, behold, look up into the sky. Well, clearly I'm thinking about it in terms of, well, of course it's time to look up into the sky. And I appreciate that dream. And the Lord is speaking to me. This is time to look up. It's the time to look up. And, you know, I just kept thinking about it like, Lord, that is just such a clear message. Well, then on the third, I was, I was in bed. It was yesterday. And, um, again, I was about ready to get up to do my devotions and my mind started thinking before I get up, you know how sometimes your mind starts thinking about the day and what you're going to do and. And I was thinking about what I wanted to pray about and what I was planning to do. Cause I really never planned to be here today. I was going to wait till Monday, but I want to give this like fresh to you. And so I said, Lord, I, 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 I started praying over what I would teach next week and the Pakistan people. And I said, and all, and so all of a sudden I just felt so tired that I did couldn't think anymore. So my mind just stopped thinking. And all of a sudden I heard this come into my mind into my heart, I heard the words, 400 years of silence. Now you have to understand that my mind, when I'm talking to the Lord about service, lessons, that kind of thing, I have bookshelves in my mind. I, I can go all through the, my Bible inside of my head. I can pull from anywhere. So I thought, 400 years of silence. And I remember seeing that a couple of days ago in my Bible because I had gone, I'd finished reading something and I was writing a note and there was that page, 400 years of silence. And I thought, why would, why would I even think about that? Because typically my mind is thinking about old New Testament. So I got up. And so I did my devotions. I prayed. I read the word. And all of a sudden it came back again, 400 years of silence. And I thought, okay, okay. I know that there's an intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew. There was 400 years. Like that wasn't like a shock to me, but I really asked the Lord, what are you, what are you trying to say to me? So I did a little bit of research. And I have read it before, but it's been so long ago. And so I, I read enough to understand that during the 400 years, we know that it ended with Malachi. And then there was 400 years where God was silent. There was no open vision. Nobody, there was no, God wasn't speaking to anybody. He, it was done with Malachi. He's like, I'm done speaking this dispensation, this administration of time ended with Malachi. And so during that 400 years, there were things that were happening. Nehemiah, the edict for him to rebuild, that happened under uh, Darius. And things were going on. You know, do just feel free to read. I don't, I'm not here with the history lesson about everything that happened in the 400 years. I just want your attention about the number 400. Okay. Then I'm going to put everything before you and then I'm going to leave it with you. Okay. So I read this as the new Testament opens, Antipater's son, Herod, the great, a descendant of Esau was king. And the priesthood was politically motivated and not of the line of Aaron. Politics also resulted in the development of two major factions, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees favored the liberal attitudes and practices of the Greeks. They held to only the Torah as regards religion, but like most aristocrats, they did not think God should have any part in governing the nation. The Pharisees were conservative zealots who, with the help of the scribes, developed religious law to the point where the concerns and care of people were essentially meaningless. Additionally, synagogues, new places of worship, and social activity had sprouted up all over the country, and religious and civil matters were governed by the lesser and the greater Sanhedrins. 
The greater Sanhedrin being comprised of a chief priest and 70 other members that handed out justice, sometimes by 39 lashes, administered with full force. Between the time of Malachi and the coming of the Messiah, several prophecies were fulfilled, including the 2300 days of desecration between 171 and 165 BC. And you can read about that in Daniel 8.14. However, the people did not put to good use either the fulfilled prophecies nor the 400 years a nation was given to study scripture, to seek God, and to prepare for the coming Messiah. In fact, those years blinded and deafened the nation to the point where most of the Jews could not even consider the concept of a humble Messiah. So you see, Everything that was written in the Torah and the prophets and everything that ended in Malachi when it went out the door. And so for 400 years, God left them with that. They had everything just like we do in a sense, but without knowing Christ. But it didn't mean anything. They went straightway headlong into idolatry completely rejecting God during that 400 years. And toward the end, you heard what I had said, what the religious landscape was of Israel. Remember, this is a parallel. This is a very interesting parallel of 400 years. Because what I just first read to you about the politics also resulted in the development of two religious factions. And no matter what, how far away they departed from God, synagogues and new places of worship and social activity went up, sprouted up all over the country. And the 400 years, they didn't put to good use of any of the fulfilled prophecies they didn't make use of the 400 years the nation was given to study scripture to seek God and to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Like this, as this theologian said, in fact, those years blinded and deafened the nation to the point where most of the Jews could not even consider the concept of a humble Messiah. You know, I thought about that and I thought, Wow. And then I thought, what's up with that number 400? And I remember like last year or something like that, there was this, it came into my mind. Oh, yeah. There's something to do with the Mayflower Compact. And I remember people were reading it and they were looking at it. And I remember several people sending me videos to look at. And for some reason, my mind wasn't ready. Like, I, I don't know what state of mind I was in or what I was doing and how busy I was. I don't even remember. I just remember trying to watch it. Hasn't that ever happened to you? Like, it's just not your time to look at. It. It's just not your time. Like, for some reason, I mean, I read it and then I just, it went, it just left me. I just didn't think any more about it. I, I don't know. You know, I was busy with so much going on in my life a year ago. I wasn't ready yet to receive it, but it popped into my mind and I went, oh yeah. So um, I started doing my own research. Of course, it's easy to do that. you know. So I looked at the Mayflower Compact and I just want you to know this before I go any further. Um, I am going to do just a little bit of reading because I need to, because I need to, you to see and to understand the parallels of the 400. And some of you are already knowing about it, but I just believe with all my heart, God is speaking to me, my, myself. I don't know about anybody else. I know a lot of you are thinking, or they're, you're getting this sensation, not, not even a sensation, a sense, a knowing, something deeper, deeper than yourself. You're like, I'm sensing Christ is coming back. And it's more than just knowing it intellectually. Because no matter what I kept, I, I mean, when I say I couldn't get away from it, it's not like I was forcing myself not to think about it. It's like, I want to be careful that I'm not going off in some direction in my flesh because God spoke something to me 
or something's entered into my heart, I want to be careful because I want to be careful with the scriptures. I want to be careful how I handle the word of truth. So that's very, very critical for me that you know that, okay? And so I understood about the Mayflower Compact. And it was originally titled An Agreement Between the Settlers of New Plymouth. It was the first governing document of Plymouth Colony. It was written by the male passengers of the Mayflower, consisting of separatist Puritans, adventurers, and tradesmen. The Puritans were fleeing from religious persecution by King James I of England. The Mayflower Compact was signed aboard ship on November 21st, 1620. Signing the covenant were 41 of the ships, 101 passengers. While the Mayflower was anchored in Provincetown Harbor with in the hook at the northern tip of Cape Cod. So I read that initially and I said, that's right. Okay, so obviously there was some kind of ceremony last year or a commemoration. There was an article about it, about commemorating, memorializing that day. And so it wasn't enough for me. I thought there's just something more because I, I'm not one of those kind of people. I don't care how close a puzzle piece looks like it fits. I'm not going to force it to fit. But there's something I believe God wanted me to observe. So I called my friend Francis and I was like, you've got to hear this. I don't know what's going on. I just heard this and I keep thinking of the 400, 400. And of course I was thinking about, you know, other something else in the Bible where 400 years is mentioned, but um, she said, well, there's a video I want you to see. And so I watched it and, you know, I take a couple of my notes from this person. His name is Daniel Vallis from Brooke Cherith. So I want you to be understanding that some of my notes I got from him. But you know what? What he taught, my spirit man, was, it's like my spirit knew already. So I just want to mention that because there's a couple things that he brought to my attention. So anyways, I'm just going to go on. So I was thinking about the fact that the, May, the Mayflower Compact was signed by Puritans. And the Puritans were... Were, they, they were leaving England because of the Catholic uh, domination of England. And so they wanted a land to go and worship. They wanted to go somewhere where they had freedom to worship God. And so what was interesting is that, let me see, I want to see if I... Okay, so what I understand about it is when they got there, before they even saw the land, before they ever embarked upon the land, while they were on the boat, they signed together. They knew that there was going to be people that were not Christians. They were headed for Virginia. They were going to go to Virginia. But then, like I said, there was other people, there was 101 passengers, but they said, look, we're going to make a covenant with God because that compact was with God. And let me further say about them, because I wanted to know, because I am not, a, I'm not a dominionist. I don't believe we're going to save the entire world and Jesus is going to come back again. That's kingdom dominion. And let me be very clear. I am not into kingdom dominionism. I'm seeking for a new heaven and a new earth, according to his promises a new heaven, a new earth, where it dwelleth righteousness. So they signed that in on November the 21st, 1620. And then a month later, on December the 21st, they actually set foot on land. And then a year later, on January the 21st, for an entire year, they built shelters, they built homes, that way they can completely unload the ship and everybody can go on worshiping God, whatever trade they were doing. And it's very important because that 400 years was a compact. It was a covenant made by, made 
to them by God. You know, so many people look at the United States and they just see 1776. Okay. Now, remember, this is not a political word. Um, I am theocratic. I am not autocratic. This is not me. I'm not, I'm not like that. You know, I, I'm talking about something prophetic, something that's not about politics at all. This is not about politics. This is something prophetic. I believe Jesus is showing me and other people have seen it, but maybe you don't know it. And the Lord is just really, really ratifying it into my heart. Because remember, it started off, behold, look up, Joni, behold, look up into the sky with a shout coming with those words. This is the document that they made. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, defender of the faith having undertaken for the glory of God and for the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof, do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the reign of our sovereign Lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland the 18th, and of Scotland the 54th, Anno Domini, 1620. So they, they signed it on the 11th, but on the 21st, they made it official. A Plymouth colony was founded. Plymouth colony was founded by a group of Puritan separatists. Bes despite the colony's relatively short existence, Plymouth holds a special role in American history. Most of the citizens of Plymouth were fleeing religious persecution and searching for a place to worship as they saw fit, rather than being entrepreneurs like many of the settlers of Jamestown of Virginia. The social and legal systems of the colony became closely tied together to the religious beliefs as well as to English custom. They had a governor and this is where the name pilgrims come from. Okay. So all of us in America, we just picture English people from the 1600s. They come here on the Mayflower and there's Thanksgiving and there's this shallow understanding and we're so invested into this nation and its politics and who's who and where, you know what I mean? Like just a whole political scheme just like what happened to the Israelites after 400 years, what they turned into. William Bradford, governor. The first use of the word pilgrims for the Mayflower passengers appeared in William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. As he finished recounting his group's 1620 departure from Leiden, he used the imagery of Hebrews 11, 13 through 16 about Old Testament strangers and pilgrims who had the opportunity to return to their old country, but instead longed for a better, that is a heavenly country. These passengers of the Mayflower, both separatists and non-separatist, are commonly referred today as pilgrims. The term is derived from a passage in Bradford's journal written years later, describing their departure from the Netherlands itself, an allusion to Hebrews eleven thirteen in the Bible. And this is, an excerpt of William Bradford's journal. It says, this is when they were departing from their land to go to another land. With mutual embraces and many tears, they took their leaves of one another, which proved to be the last leave to many of them. 
but they knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted their eyes to heaven. Remember? Joni, behold, look up into the sky. It says, but lifted up their eyes to heaven, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. So you get this picture of these people who were saying goodbye for the last time to their friends and family from that country. But they saw another country, and that is a heavenly one. What's interesting is 150 years later, I want to say one more thing about them because I'm not going to read everything. But I was reading about them because I wanted more information like, yeah, but when they were coming here, was their idea to like everything? I mean, like, I don't know, you know, like how the new apostolic reformation kingdom dominion, was that their thought? Were they just going to say, okay, this is the promised land, this land that we're in this new America. And the answer is no. In fact, they actually stayed under the authority of that King. So they weren't renegade. They weren't apostate citizens. They stayed under the authority of that king, but they came here and they said they made a they made a covenant with God before they even saw the land. They hadn't even stepped foot on it. They hadn't even seen it. But in their hearts, from what I understood through more reading, was that they didn't look at this land. They didn't look at it at all. Like this is it. This is the promised land that they looked for another land that they knew that they were strangers and pilgrims and that while they were going to have more freedom of freedom without catholic infiltration of the church of england that they would be able to worship god in freedom without that and so i i think that's important for you to know in case you didn't know that i needed to know that for myself so about 150 years later comes 1776 and that's what we be and that's you know it, it says you know, that that's what we see today. So everybody looks at our nation because it's what 100 and 244 years. I'm not quite sure exactly. It's, it's, it's up there well over 200. I should have had that exact thing, but it doesn't matter. Our nation, we think started at 1776. Then when we begin to see George Washington, the white house, the flag, the Eagle, the constitution, the Capitol building, the Washington monument, the great seal and the free Masons. This is what Americans today associate as being what America has always been. But notice that in 1776, this is when the enemy entered in and took over with a new form of an occult government. See, the enemy wants this nation. This nation is going to go with the rest of this world in the judgments. Remember, this is not political. This is prophetic. This is spiritual. And so at 7076, you get all these things that are completely Masonic and have, you know, everything has everything to do the washington monument we know it's a phallus symbol we know it represents the god osiris we know that prometheus is an apollos and these are two and osiris these are three major greek gods that have entered in in 1976 and their temples built to them and their planetary designed capital buildings and all those things you know we know all about that And so this is where you see the contrast of the children of light and the children of darkness, because now since 7076 and up until this present time, what have we seen? We have seen the body of Christ or this other form of the body of Christ, just like you saw in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember in the beginning how I read to you in the four at the end, at the beginning of the opening, at the end of the 400 years and the opening of the New Testament it says that 
the priesthood was politically motivated and it was not of the line of Aaron. They were completely passed over. And politics also resulted in the development of two major factions, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, and that's what we have here. We, we have, this is how I'm seeing it because I'm sharing this from how I see it is we have this, what we look at this mainstream system of a church, a religious system. And they are so politicized now. They have a political gospel. They don't even really realize it. The multitudes that go to the churches in the United States don't even realize how deeply intertwined the gospel is with politics. They're looking for the salvation of this nation. They're looking to bring back some kind of idea of glory from 1776 and they do the 19 the 1776 and the the little flute and the guys hitting the drums that's not at all what that covenant began with but there was another government that came and took over and it turned this nation into a godless nation a nation that hates everything christian there's no fear of God. And right now, really, again, think about it. Since that nation began, look at what this nation has turned into. It doesn't look anything like that original compact that was made. And it is an occult government. He knows everybody's wants their certain man to come in but everybody has to pledge allegiance and they have to take oaths to i osiris and you may not even know that but there's special ceremonies that every man that becomes a president before he's sworn into office he goes into some special room in the white house somewhere and he does a special form formal ceremony unto osiris anyway um so it's not really it's like i said it's not about politics at all it's about which country do you belong to who is your builder what country or city are you seeking because listen this government embraces see the government that was set up by the puritans embraced the chief cornerstone remember the words that they said they made that compact they made that compact they said having undertaken for the glory of god and the advancement of the christian faith that was what they were saying they undertook for the glory of god and for the advancement of the christian faith and they embraced the chief cornerstone in 1776 there was a new cornerstone and it was a Washington monument. It's interesting because the cornerstone on it, I don't like to get a whole lot into Masonic uh, things, but that is an absolutely satanic monument. And I don't want to get into that, but that's their chief cornerstone. You know, William Bradford, looked at hebrews 11 13 through 16 and this was the absolute heart of the pilgrims that they weren't looking for an actual land as like this is it our promised land every word of hebrews 11 13 through 16 they embraced embraced and that is what they actually told their family members their friends while they were parting from them they they basically carved that word on their heart and they were they considered themselves strangers and aliens strangers and pilgrims on the earth and they in the hebrews 11 13 through 16 it says these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and see they didn't even see that land they were coming to they saw it afar off and they made that compact with god and they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth 
See, they knew that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were going somewhere to worship God freely. And they embrace them and confess that, right? It says, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. So when they said goodbye to their friends and family in England, they said goodbye forever. That's why they were saying they there was tears and everything, but they looked up and they saw another country the heavenly one. It says, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city. Remember they, it said in William Bradford's journal with mutual embraces and many tears, they took their leaves of one another, which proved to be the last leave to many of them. But they knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted their eyes to heaven, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. You know, there's no record of the term pilgrims being used to describe Plymouth's founders for 150 years after Bradford wrote this passage, except when quoting him. So it's kind of interesting how that term pilgrim was just conveniently allowed to fade off. And so when you think of pilgrims, you think about it in such a commercialized you have your kids at school making cardboard, construction paper, hats, and then you eat turkey and everything. No way, man. Those people looked at themselves as strangers on this earth, and they were going to find a place to worship God. And they said goodbye to their friends and family and their own land and made a covenant with God before they even saw the land they were going to. In Genesis 15, 13 through 14, God said, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. This is an interesting parallel. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward, they shall come out with great substance. You know, the only difference between the Israelites and us is that we're not taking anything with us at all when we leave. Also, the clock started when, the, when they entered the land of Egypt. So this Mayflower Covenant started the day they entered the land on foot, which is December 1620, where they began unloading provisions on land and built houses. And it took them till the end of January 21st until they had built enough shelter and started to unload the boat and get off the boat completely. So in January, in January uh, 21st, 1620, that's when they, you know, the rubber stamp went down. So starting really from January, because everything was done, now they can unload the boat and now they're at the land. Isn't it interesting that it has been 400 years completely starting this January 21st? I thought about that 400 years of silence where Jesus, where there was no, there was silence. There was silence in heaven. There was nobody talking. God was not talking to the people. He left them with a big chunk of Old Testament writing, but they ignored it. They ignored the prophecies. They became idolaters. They became absolutely political. They built all kinds of religious social places and temples all over the place. They had their aristocratic, wealthy Sadducees who controlled the Pharisees and everybody was in it for politics. It had all to do with politics. So when Jesus came, they didn't want to receive him. But do you see the parallel? It's been over 400 years. I'm not even saying America is any player at all. America is not even mentioned in the Bible. But I live in America. And if you're an American and you're listening to this, even if you're not, you know we're the new kid on the block. But really, we're really 400 years. And we made, and those people, those Puritans made a covenant, not because they wanted to take over the land and like new apostolic reformation who are completely, 
completely in gross heretical error. They don't even know what they're teaching. But it's been 400 years since that compact was signed and ratified. A compact, a covenant with God. And 150 years later, Satan entered in with his occult government. And since 1776, he has thrashed this nation. And now this nation is under judgment. It is going to go under judgment. And we are seeing it. And you know, I thought about that dream I had. It was the Sabbath. I, I was in panic. I have to go. I have to find a holy place. I believe when we leave here with Christ, that will be our Sabbath rest. We will enter in to our Sabbath rest. That's what I think that dream I had means. Just as God told Abram, just like he told them, told him, he said, let me get over there because I want to read it again. And also, and listen where it says, and we're children of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. And we are strangers and pilgrims in this land that doesn't fully belong to us. We're citizens of another country. We're just strangers and pilgrims passing through this land, which is, in a sense, very spiritually like Egypt. And it says, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And are we not seeing Christianity going? I mean, it's like if you're a Christian now, people don't care if you say you're a Christian, just don't talk about Jesus. Don't talk about the blood of the lamb. Don't talk about eternal life. And it's going to become more and more dangerous. And during the tribulation, it'll be worse. And it says also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And that substance, that substance we're laying up ahead. We're sending ahead. We're sending everything ahead into the heavenly kingdom. For that's the kingdom that we're looking for. And that's the kingdom. 400 years ago, those Puritans were looking for. And so I just wanted to share that because I thought, you know, there is such an incredible parallel. And I truly believe that this is our time to watch. This is our time now to look up in the sky. This is our time now. You know, I kept thinking today, like, I just felt so powerfully within deep in my spirit. This is not a time like in my dream where people are like, what's wrong with you? People were drinking, partying, entertainment. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you got to go stand out there and stare up at the sky like a statue. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about a posture because I believe if you are truly looking for your Lord to come, our Lord to come, you are one of his. See, I'm looking for him to come. It's time. It's more than time. When I saw myself going up that little boat by myself and it was night, I was by myself. I left everybody. I left everybody. No one understood. They thought I was crazy. What are you talking about? What's wrong with you? Okay. But I was like, I got to get there. I got to go to a holy place. This is not the time to let, to let this world swallow you up. I believe we are going to see this nation being judged. Let me just share something interesting with you. Just a thought. Lately, there's been a lot of mice in the neighborhood. And then recently, I heard that in our city, probably other cities, there's been an inf infestation of mice. Um, I saw an article from Australia about a radical infestation of mice. 
They don't know what to do with it. The cities that I'm mentioning to you are up in arms. There's another city. LA is infested with mice. Another, I mean, you don't know all the cities here and it doesn't matter, but let me tell you something. There are cities here in California and they are being infested with mice that it is so bad. The pest control cannot even keep up with it. They're proliferating. Then I saw another article in, in Arabia that they are being taken over by mice. They don't even know what to do about it. I was reading about this in other nations. And I thought that's a plague. And this CV-19, it's a plague. This whole world is getting ready for a change of administration. And we are the ones that are looking. Are you looking for him? Are you looking for Christ to come? It says we, according to his promise, look. There's two things we look for. 2 Peter 3, 13. For we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And it says unto, in, nine, in Hebrews 9, 27, unto them that look for him, will he return unto again, again unto them the second time without sin unto salvation. What about 2 Timothy 2? Verse 4, 6 through 8, I think, where he says, I'm ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And now henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me, but not unto me only, but unto all them. That love is appearing. Do you love is appearing? Are you looking for him? Are you living that way? See, I'm not, it's not about, well, I got to stand still. Carry on with what you're doing. You have duties to do. Do them well. Serve God well. But the whole while, in your spirit and in your heart, are you looking for him? Because we are now, we are now there. Behold, look up into the sky.